Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. I can't sleep. I don't. Everything feels flat and grey. I feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder, with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry, and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again, with proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. Subject to forthcoming clinical trial results, we will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. Thanks so much um, and welcome everyone to this webinar. We're delighted to be with ACNEM and um, thank them for their support um, of Mind Medicine Australia and for sharing what is a really important topic um, and an emerging topic for anyone interested in health and wellbeing. We're going to take you through some of the research um, the scale of the problem that we're facing in Australia and the way forward for Australia and after which we'll be very happy to answer your questions. So here we are with this major mental health epidemic. Many people say that uh, this mental health pandemic is going to be far worse than the COVID pandemic we're experiencing. And these are the figures the stats around mental health in Australia before fires and before COVID. These figures are set to escalate by at least 30% according to mental health experts. But before COVID and the bushfires, one in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness. One in eight of us were on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians. And children as young as five being prescribed antidepressants and other psychiatric medicines. It's estimated that one in two of us will experience mental illness in our lifetimes and we're seeing a rising increase in suicides and even just in the last six weeks alone, we've seen an increase of 33% of young people um, with self-harm issues presenting to emergency departments in hospitals. So this lockdown and, and this crisis are certainly affecting the mental health of our nation severely. What we also see is that there's even worse outcomes for veterans and responders. So the incidence of mental illness and a range of different mental illnesses um, is significant for those particular cohorts. And also for a range of other cohorts, we also see that lawyers and um, accountants and, and others are also experiencing um, high rates of mental illness. One of the other things about this crisis is the massive impact on 
sufferers, families and carers. And of course, adults with a mental illness are nearly twice as likely to be unemployed um, as normal Australians. And there's a strong correlation, of course, between natural disasters and mental illness. Um, mental illness obviously is a primary cause of suicide and homelessness. And the cost of mental illness is estimated to be about $180 billion a year. That was the Australian Productivity Commission's 2019 draft report. But again, these figures will escalate in the next slide. Thank you. So there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes uh, for the past 50 years. There's been no innovation in treatment. And so we can talk a lot about um, patient access gateways and telehealth and you know improvements to the system in those sorts of ways. But the elephant in the room is that there has been no innovation in treatment for nearly 50 years. And during that 50 years, we've seen this massive spike in mental illness, loneliness, social isolation, disconnection and division in our society. Only about 35% of sufferers experience remission from pharmacotherapy, which is primarily antidepressants or psychotherapy. For many patients, um, they relapse after treatment stops. And of course, there's some very nasty side effects uh, to these pharmacological medicines. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, only about 20 to 30% of sufferers show some response and remission rates are even lower. So PTSD is even harder to treat. So more of the same approach is not going to solve the problems that we have at the moment in our mental health sector. So we set up Mind Medicine Australia. Um, it was launched at the start of 2019. We're a registered charity. And our goal is to seek to broaden the treatment paradigm available to medical practitioners and their patients and to improve treatment effectiveness by establishing safe, accessible and effective medicine-assisted therapies in Australia for major mental illnesses. <clears throat> Our current primary focus is on medicinal psilocybin for depression and medicinal MDMA for PTSD. However, we're also interested um, in other psychedelics, including ketamine, ibogaine, ayahuasca and DMT. For us, success will be that these therapies become an integrated part of the mental health system so that if you go along to your medical practitioner, they will offer you this treatment is one of the first line of treatments with full disclosure on the benefits and drawbacks of each kind of treatment. This is because these treatments achieve such high remission rates and we hope that by becoming an integrated part of the mental health system that these medicines will be able to heal millions of people in Australia who are suffering and that they are accessible and affordable to all Australians no matter where they're located or their ability to pay for these treatments. So we've put together a, a board um, that comprises, you know, some of the most interesting and influential people around Australia, including the former head of the armed forces there, Chris Barry, Peter Hunt, my husband, uh, we're the co-founders, Jane Burns, who's the head of mental health at Swinburne Uni, Simon Longstaff, the head of the Ethics Centre, Mono, who's a lawyer, Andrew Robb, the former trade minister, and Nicholas, who's an entrepreneur. And the next slide. And we'll just whiz through these now. And our, our team, our ambassadors, who are some of the leading researchers in the world, psychiatrists, medical practitioners, behavioural scientists, religious leaders, anthropologists, pharmacologists, lawmakers, and so on. As I mentioned, our primary focus is on medicinal psilocybin and medicinal MDMA, which are also now being trialled for obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction and PTSD also for the treatment of addiction. These medicines are also now being trialled for eating disorders, early stage dementia, other addictions, um, and even cluster headaches. The remarkable thing about these medicines is that they only require two to three medicinal sessions in combination with psychotherapy, in contrast to conventional treatments. The medicines are curative, not palliative. So this is not just about managing symptoms and a lifetime sentence of mental illness. 
It's actually about healing, about being cured. And some people describe them as antibiotics for the mind because it's just a short course and then you're better. The medicines are considered very safe in medically controlled environments and are non-addictive. Both medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the Food and Drug Administration in the US to fast track the approval process. And this designation is only given to medicines considered vastly superior to existing treatments. So Alana, you might want to speak briefly about how the medicines are actually administered and um, the differences between psilocybin and MDMA treatments. Sure. So psychedelic assisted psychotherapy typically involves um, two to three dose sessions with a combination of, of psychotherapy with, with professionals that are, are trained in, in science, but as well as esoteric, spiritual, potentially shamanic knowledge. So having a, a wealth of um, experience to be able to hold the, the trauma in the room. And the major differences between the medicines, uh, MDMA is an empathogen, which opens up the heart, and that's why it's so effective with PTSD. People are able to talk about their trauma and experience it and revisit it without going into dissociation or panic attacks or, you know, all shut down. So MDMA op opens them up uh, within a safe container held by the therapist to be able to relive and explore their trauma safely. Psilocybin um, typically impacts um, the default mode network in the brain. And when that's shut down, rumination, rigid thinking, um, depression, the, all those structures that are associated with, um, with, with depression are shut down and the brain lights up and areas that have never been connected before light up. Great. And we'll talk further about those mechanisms as we go. So here you can see again the safety record for, for both these medicines. So, you know, there's been uh, over 120 current or recent trials and there's been actually no adverse events in any of those trials. And there you can actually see a patient undergoing the therapy and you can see that they're there with two therapists, they've got an eye mask on, they've got headphones on and they're, they're listening to a, to a wonderful music playlist. And whilst that might be a hospital or clinic room, it's set up in a way to make it appear much more comfortable and not like a traditional sort of hospital or very sort of dry clinical space. Next slide. This is uh, one of the favourite uh, tables that we have, a study that was done by the University of Melbourne last year, um, comparing relative drug harms. So there you can see alcohol uh, in the blue, harm to self, in the red, a harm to others. Alcohol by far the most dangerous um, drug of all. And down the other end, you see ecstasy, or MDMA and psilocybin. So we've got this all the wrong way around, sadly. And uh, when Nixon had his war on drugs and uh, prohibited the use of these medicines, unfortunately, he didn't prohibit the use of alcohol, which does the, the greatest damage of all to the largest amount of people. So one of the wonderful things about having set up this charity is that we hear so many incredible stories of people who have been healed by these medicines. Sadly, though, as well, we also hear heart breaking stories and this week is no exception I think every day I'm hearing through the phone calls and emails some of the most heartbreaking stories you can possibly imagine of people who have tried multiple different treatments either for themselves for their children or their parents in some cases and they're really at, at wit's end um, many of them feel like there is no hope and um, this is their really their last hope for many people uh, for getting better and for leading a meaningful life. You see here um, some of the testimonials from patients. The one there from Joel Harrop, a, a veteran. One week of intensive treatment provided transformational healing. New York University end of life patient um, in one of the studies with the New York University for patients with a terminal diagnosis through psilocybin 
80% of those patients went into remission and five years later they were retested. Many were still alive and most of them were still in remission. Everyone deserved to have this experience, but if everyone did, no one could ever do harm to another again. Wars would be impossible to wage. I think this one uh, from the Israel uh, trial of MDMA really sums it up. I felt like I went through 15 years of psychological therapy in one night. What an amazing gift we could give people by giving them these treatments. So um, this is a really interesting chart, I think. You know, the normal effect size for antidepressants for depression is on average effect size of D equals 0.3 on the Cohen scale. But we see there that psilocybin for depression is 2.0 to 3.1, which is seven to 10 times more effective. We also see the relatively high effectiveness of MDMA, the PTSD, psilocybin for alcoholism, for end of life distress, and so on. Next slide. And this is a, one of my favorite slides. So as Alana spoke about, um, one of the, the remarkable things, particularly about psilocybin, is that it bypasses the default mode network of the brain, which, as Alana mentioned, keeps us stuck in our rigid and um, stuck thought loops, such as I'm not good enough, life won't work out for me, no one loves me. I'm sure we all know people who are experiencing depression and say those things repeatedly. And you'll see there are um, two circles on the right of the screen. These are based on fMRI scans. Uh, on the right, you see a patient who is um, you know, suffering from depression. Um, they have very limited uh, neural connections occurring there and their brain's not really talking to, it, to itself very well. Um, and then on the left one, you see the intervention with psilocybin, which creates this massive neuroplasticity um, increased new neural connections, but also rewiring of old neural connections, enabling patients to break out of their repetitive and rigid styles of thinking and form active coping mechanisms to restore a sense of patient agency, to empower patients really to start their own healing process rather than relying on, on pills or um, other types of treatments for the rest of their lives. The other thing I think that's really important to say about these medicines is they act as a, I like to think of as a, a reboot or a reset of the hard drive, our brain. Or you might like to think of them as defragging the faulty drives and just getting rid of all the rubbish, just cleaning up the mess and the baggage that we amass. Um, you know, through our lives and that we carry along with us and that holds us back from experiencing our full potential as human beings. One of the other remarkable things about these medicines is that the remission rates actually improve over time. Um, now, this is particularly important in medically controlled environments because these medicines uh, only achieve these sorts of results in combination with psychotherapy. So if people are having these medicines in combination with excellent psychotherapy and excellent integration sessions, we see these remarkable improvements. And you can see there that at the six month follow-up, the remissions have increased. And if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a particularly good example of that. So this next slide talks about MDMA psychotherapy again for PTSD. So just important to say to all of you out there just going, oh, no, MDMA is that party drug, you know, young people, you know, have overdoses with and so on. Well, firstly, MDMA is not ecstasy. We're talking about pure MDMA, pure medicinal GPM grade MDMA. Unfortunately, most of what is called MDMA out in the recreational drug scene at rave parties and music festivals is um, pills that are adulterated with other substances. It could be speed, it could be other drugs. Um, quite often the pills, even though the kids think they're buying MDMA, don't have any MDMA in them at all. And the pills are often taken in combination with alcohol, um, dehydration because they're not drinking enough and sweating a lot. But MDMA, pure MDMA is a highly effective medicine in combination with psychotherapy. 
As Alana mentioned, it decreases fear and dis defensiveness, creates um, a wonderful sense of, of trust and empathy and safety in the therapeutic environment, and decreases the activity of the amygdala, which is associated with traumatic memory. And as Alana said, so patients are not being re-triggered. And I particularly want to mention this MAPS phase two trial because this trial is the one that led to the current phase three trials. So there were 105 participants, all with treatment resistant PTSD for an average of 18 years. So we can just imagine the suffering that they'd experience in their lives. And 52% of them went into remission immediately after the treatment, three treatment sessions, and 68% at the 12 month follow up. This is really significant because the normal remission rates for those suffering from PTSD are a maximum of 20%. So currently the phase three trial taking place at 15 research sites in the US, Canada and Israel is showing a 90% or greater probability that there will be statistically significant results when all participants have been treated. And MDMA is likely to be prescribable in the US in 18 months, which is very exciting. And psilocybin is expected to follow um, soon after that. So as I mentioned, there's, there's new trials taking place all over the world for a range of other conditions like eating disorders, dementia and other addictions. And we're also seeing... Uh, Schemes like expanded access schemes in Australia, the SASB scheme, special access scheme, passionate use scheme that enables physicians to apply to the regulator for approval to treat patients suffering from treatment resistant PTSD or depression outside of a clinical trial. So a psychiatrist can apply for a patient where they've tried numerous other treatments which have failed and where the patient is in danger of getting sicker or is in danger of committing suicide. And we're now starting to see a number of psychiatrists in Australia applying for special access scheme uh, approvals for their patients. And a number of those have been granted already. Uh, sadly, I should say, though they've been granted at a federal level by the TGA, there are certain state rules in some states, particularly New South Wales and Queensland, that make it difficult to bring the medicines into those states at the moment because there's only rules in those states for recreational use, against recreational use of the drugs, but there are no rules for actual therapeutic use of these as medicines. So some laws need to be changed in some states of Australia. We're also seeing decriminalisation taking place in a number of states and Oregon and California are voting on legalising medicinal psilocybin as well. So the key question is for Australia, how can we make sure that we keep up with the rest of the world? Or could we even become leaders in this space and be the gateway to Asia Pacific for these medicines? So this chart shows some of the significant universities around the world which are leading research and development in this space. So you can see Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Imperial College and others. There's no Australian universities on that chart, sadly, um, but we are starting to see some proposals coming through for some trials in Australia. It's important, I think, to say that we support novel trials for Australia, but we don't believe in replicating trials that have been done overseas very effectively with large patient cohorts. And last year, there was the establishment of two centres for psychedelic research, one at Imperial College in London and one at Johns Hopkins University. And we're looking at setting up a centre of excellence for emerging mental health therapies in partnership with the university in Australia, which is extremely exciting and I'll speak further about in a moment. So there was 120 current or recent trials completed and you can see that we're back just above uh, where we were back in 1970. Lost 50 years where many people unfortunately uh, were unable to achieve the full potential uh, of their lives and, and in some cases lost their lives. Uh, but fortunately we are seeing this renaissance now of trials in this space. And this is Australia's very first clinical trial taking place at St Vincent's in Melbourne, part 
funded by Mind Medicine Australia for medicinal psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of patients experiencing depression and anxiety. And uh, we'll be hearing further about that in time. So the wonderful thing about these medicines is that they've been used ever since the beginning of human civilization. Uh, magic mushrooms appear in ancient um, archaeological sites, in ancient Greek and ancient Rome, and they've been used in ancient tribes in South America and Mexico, all over the world. We've also had our own indige indigenous medicines like acacia in Australia. And in the 50s and 60s, over 40,000 patients were healed from a range of conditions through these medicines, and they were considered the next big thing in psychiatry. We also recently, just in the last couple of weeks, saw the historical announcement by the Canadian government uh, to allow terminally ill patients to have access to psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy to heal and ease their anxiety, which is just superb to see that leadership from Canada. And here we see Dr Stan Groff, a leading psychiatrist, who said that psychedelics used responsibly would be for psychiatry what the microscope is for biology and medicine or the telescope is for astronomy. These medicines are truly groundbreaking when used in the right environments with the right type of therapy. So what happened? What caused all this stigma? What caused these medicines to be outlawed? Well, unfortunately, the Nixon presidency um, decided to target the hippies and black people and um, they couldn't uh, imprison them for demonstrations. So they decided to uh, attack them for by criminalising the use of drugs. And that was the infamous war on drugs. You see there a comment of one of Nixon's senior aides where he said, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So they fully were aware of the fact that these medicines had been used as medicines to heal tens of thousands of people but unfortunately that didn't stop them from their political actions. So the war on drugs was entirely political, it was not based on any science and people like Professor David Nutt and many other medical ex experts describe this as the worst censorship of research and medical treatment in the history of humanity. And indeed, it is a travesty against humanity that these medicines have not been available and not been able to be researched for the past 40 years until the past few years with this renaissance. So interestingly enough, when we started Mind Medicine Australia in uh, early 2019, there was just one startup. And now we see over 30. This is just an example. Um, and there's probably not a week that goes by that we don't hear about another company starting up in the for-profit space because many people are seeing these medicines as the most prospective um, new industry in the world. So even um, exceeding ca the cannabis industry in terms of um, the efficacy of these medicines and their application to a wide variety of conditions. So four key strategic areas that we're focused on, education and events like these, and we're delighted to support ACNEM and other organisations who are like-minded um, with educating their members and their communities. We run regular webinars. We have a free webinar series taking place at the moment. We also run screenings of very educational, informative films and documentaries. We're planning a major international medical summit for November 2021 with some of the leading researchers, psychiatrists, doctors from around the world. We encourage you all to attend. And we're also looking at promoting relevant novel research. And we have state and regional chapters. We have 23 chapters in Australia and four in New Zealand. We invite you to join our chapters if you'd like to get involved and know more. And if you're in an area where we don't have a chapter, then you might want to start one of your own. But our goal is to build this ecosystem to provide as much support as we can to enable these medicines to be available to those who are suffering.
We're also commencing a professional development program and Alana is on the steering committee for that. A certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. Alana, would you like to briefly talk about that? Yes, we're very excited. We've mm -hmm. um, got a cohort starting in, in January and then one in July and it's for um, for GPs, psychiatrists, counsellors, mental health nurses, uh, mental health social workers, psychologists and people who have a bachelor in the mental health field and above to um, to do this incredible course, which will really be integrating the, the the Western biomedical model with, as I said, the, the spiritual, esoteric, um, psychedelic, theoretical frameworks so that when, when clinicians are trained and ready to provide the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, they have a really in-depth and holistic um, you know, framework to be able to guide those people safely with the medicine. And um, we have two intakes, so um, the first of those in January and the, first, the second in July, but we only have about 10 places remaining for the first intake. And we're also thrilled that um, we've brought Renee Harvey, who's a leading psychologist from the UK to Australia, and she's designing the course alongside the steering committee. And uh, she worked on the psilocybin trials at Imperial College, which are some of the most historic and important trials in the space. So we're very lucky to have her um, helping to design the course and manage the course. As I mentioned earlier, we're also looking at this Centre for Emerging Mental Health Therapies in partnership with the University for Applied Research and Development, looking at supply chains and manufacturing um, and growth of, of the medicines in Australia, economic modelling. We're looking at rollout of, of clinics. Um, we're also looking at the preferred legal and ethical frameworks for these medicines. And Alana will talk about the psychological support services in a moment when we get to that slide. So there's that start again. What are we going to do about it, ladies and gentlemen? That's the big question. Are some of the ways that you can help to uh, spread the word about these medicines. So we'd love you to share this webinar. Uh, it's being recorded. So we'll also um, uh, attach a video that you can share with your with your communities start conversations, volunteer, um, join our chapters. We've got a wonderful learn section on the website. Talk to your, your doctors and other medical professionals so that everyone in the medical profession uh, learns about the science and that we get rid of the stigma. Um, help by supporting us through fundraising. Uh, Peter and I are philanthropists, so we donate our time and money to this we have no profit motive whatsoever. Our only goal is to help people who are suffering. Talk to your local MPs, attend our events and so on. So this is really important to say that um, historically we've just put in some missions uh, to reschedule medicinal MDMA and medicinal psilocybin from prohibited substances to controlled medicines. So we encourage each of you to put in submissions to make sure that these medicines can be rescheduled. And you can do that either as a therapist, as a person with lived experience, or just as a person who's concerned about the mental health epidemic in Australia and understands the importance of there being more treatment options available to practitioners and patients so that we can get more people well. We have a how-to guide on our website that helps to make the submission process super easy. It can just be, you know, a paragraph or half a page. Um, but please do put in submissions. The more submissions that the TGA gets, the better. And um, this will help to also make sure that we can counter dissenting voices who may be less informed about these medicines as well. So this is a certificate uh, in psychedelic assisted therapies, which Alana's already mentioned, and there's way more on our website about that. And we encourage any therapists out there who'd like to be, you know, in the first cohort or two of, of qualified psychedelic assisted therapists in Australia to apply as soon as you can so that you get the chance to, to lead in this space. Mm -hmm. I began the psychological support medicine uh, psychological support service at Mind Medicine about seven months ago and it's been an incredible seven months, um, this vision coming true for Australia. So as part of our service, we provide 
um, integration support for people who are already working with medicines, whether they've gone overseas legally or are uh, wanting to apply for the SASB uh, legal clinical pathway, or who may be in the community and needing a really ethical and professional uh, support service. So with that, we provide individual counselling through Skype, obviously telehealth, um, in our clinics, our subcontractors are at various places around Australia. Zoom integration groups, so bringing people together online who are working with these medicines and are needing needing support so that they don't experience you know, stigma and shame and, and isolation. We uh, have, we're reg registered with NDIS, so um, we have people using some of their plans through, through NDIS for integration and mental health support, and of course, bulk billing and all other private health schemes. We also have um, Zoom study groups where anyone who is interested in studying psychedelics can join, and they're only $35 for an hour and a half, and together as a team, we review the articles, we share integration stories and we're you know growing together as a community and that's the same with peer supervision we also offer peer supervision for mental health professionals for $35 for an hour and a half and um yeah drawing each other's knowledge and, and expertise to to support our clients and training we do lots of webinars lots of community education networks um i'm a member of the APS transpersonal psychology and the Mental Health Professional Network. So really trying to get um, as much of this education out to the community as possible. And ensuring, you know, as, as Tanya mentioned before, uh, people can feel that they've had 15 years of therapy in one night, which is very true. I hear that all the time. But what do, what do they do with that insight? That's not, that's not 15 years worth of action. Uh, and this is where our therapists come in to help them ground, ground that those experiences, those deeply transformative experiences into how to be, you know, the best mum they can be, the best, you know, best at their job, their, you know, parenting, how they can live those um, insights in the practical world and um, address, you know, whatever mental health issues they're going through. So I invite you all to uh, make contact with me, um, with us, and, you know, if, you, if you're interested in joining in our supervision or our Zoom groups, uh, please, please let me know. We're also expanding um, our team in the future to include integrative therapists because, you know, I, I, I don't want this to just, just be this space just to be dominated by psychologists and allied health. It needs to include, you know, multidisciplinary professionals who have expertise in these medicines as well as their their chosen um, field of practice. So, yeah, really interested in hearing from from all of you. So this is uh, Tim Ferris, who's one of the the great supporters of psychedelic assisted therapy globally and it's worth signing up to his blog actually because he does provide a lot of information and, and webinars with some of the leaders in this space but he says there's an opportunity to use relatively small amounts of money to have billions of dollars of impact and heal millions of people which is why we got involved because it's not often you get the chance to actually impact millions of people and through these medicines becoming available, um, the potential is enormous. And this is the summit next year. Um, these are some of the leaders who will be coming to Australia for this, hopefully, if our borders ever open. And um, we invite you to join us at that as well. And I think that's about it with the presentation. Is that right, Alana? Yes. So we'll, we'll go now to the chat screen, I think, and, and start um, looking at the Q&A. Okay. I've um, started to collect some of the questions here. So I'm going to start with the first one, which was from Axel. What are the recommended doses that are being tested on patients currently and is there a threshold for dosing? So dosing is, is a very specific um, thing and that's something that um, is not, you know, it's, it's patient by patient treatment by treatment so that's not something that we can talk about um, in the seminar um, but if people wish to reach out or know more there's a there's a lot more about this on our website fantastic I can, if i can just jump in there the uh, the maps um, mdma and psilocybin protocols that have been published the peer review protocols have um, the the guidelines and measurements that they go by, but it's it's case by case and it's it's based on weight and other clinical factors. So, but that's all in those documents. 
Now, Sanjeev, I think, just wants some clarification because he said, I think he said medicines are only available in the USA in 18 months. Is it already available in Australia? And I thought you yes. said that they're available via the Special Access Scheme B. That's is that right. correct? That's correct. So when we talk about the 18 months, that's prescribable as medicine, mm -hmm. so that will be through the, the medical system. Yeah. But like cannabis... Um, cannabis is available through the SASB scheme as well on a case-by-case -case basis now. And, you know, there's about 4,000 approvals going through a month. And similarly, well, unfortunately not 4,000 approvals a month for, for this yet, but um, the difference between the SASB here and cannabis, important to say, is the patient never gets to take the medicine home. It is delivered in a clinician's, in the clinic or in, you know, a hospital or clinical environments. Very important to reinforce that to, to all of you. Now, Axel asks, what are the long-term implications? And I guess that means of, of you know, sort of taking the, the medicines, either of them. Well, health and happiness. <laughs> um, so, that, you know, and, and it's not a long-term, I mean, these are not long-term medicines. That's why, you know, many doctors describe them as antibiotics for the mind. Yes. If, you know, if they're delivered properly um, in medically controlled environments with the right supervision, then the patient should go into remission. Yes, they may need a top up from time to time or, you know, and that's something that, that remains to be tested and researched. But if the treatment is delivered professionally and properly, the patient should be able to, to be cured in, in many cases. Of course, not in all cases. I mean, no medicine is 100% cure. And, you know, like all medicines, these medicines suit some people with some conditions better than they will with others. Tony, you mentioned in the clinical trials that there were no adverse events. Um, were you talking about serious adverse events? Did they have any side effects, for example? Um. Not that I'm aware of. So, Alana, do you want to comment Most on that? Just yeah. Um, obviously, I'm only I'm, I'm across a lot of the research that the adverse effects typically are that you know the, the psychological distress that patients experience. For example, going through ego death with psilocybin, which then you know later integrated as to be one of the most beneficial events of their life. Mm -hmm. So what is typically perceived as, I guess, adverse or challenging with the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy as the, um, the support to integrate that, um, you know, the subjective data is, is suggesting that those, those distressing events actually correlated very highly with, um, you know, depression decreasing and, and the ego, the ego death and actually the reset of the mind. Sorry. And just, just further to that, actually, I mean, so some people talk about bad trips, um, you know, seeing things in their, in their sessions that are difficult. Well, that's the whole point, really. Um, you know, if, if people are going to get better, they need to face up to whatever shadows and, and darkness is residing in their psyche. Mm. And when they face up to that and go into that, discomfort that's where the true healing occurs mm. and that's one of the reasons why these medicines are so effective and you know you're there with a guide the whole time so even if you come up against things that are difficult well someone can hold your hand I remember in my first couple of experiences I was constantly calling the guide hold my hand <laughs> you know but after a while you start to get braver and you go okay this is coming up and I'm so glad it's coming up because now I can deal with it. And are there any potential, I guess, interactions with pharmaceuticals that you're aware of at all? That... Yeah, so we have, um, so, th you know, there are certain, um, <clears throat> so before you, for example, have um, sessions of psilocybin or MDMA, um, other psychedelic medicines, there is a, a period of time that you stop and, and um, so we titrate down your, your antidepressants. And actually, we have a, a very important section in our Learn section of Mind Medicine's website where there's a number of downloadable documents. And one of them is a contraindications um, document. Another one is, you know, how long you need to be off antidepressants before you take the psilocybin. You could have a psilocybin session straight on the back of an antidepressant, but you probably wouldn't feel anything because one of the things about antidepressants is they tend to numb out um, a lot of your receptors. And so that means that um, 
I know people, for example, who've been on antidepressants for a long time and they've had to go off the antidepressants gradually so that they can then experience these medicines and get the full healing benefits from them. Okay, um, I've got a, a these are going to sort of jump around a little bit later, so sorry about this, but um, someone, uh, Tessa is asking, how can a New Zealand GP work in this way in New Zealand? Do you know much about what's happening in New Zealand? Yeah, so we have four chapters in New Zealand for a start. So Tessa, I encourage you to connect to our chapters there and, and reach out to us um, at Mind Medicine Australia. Um, I'm noticing, Erin, that you're on this call, so you might like to put our, our email address in the in the chat screen. And I guess, Kylie, you'll be putting our web link and so on hmm. there anyway. Yep. So, so reach out to us. Um, New Zealand is also, you know, there's some research taking place in New Zealand. There's an enormous amount of interest um, in this space in New Zealand. And we encourage people um, in New Zealand to keep working with Australia. Um, Australia is, like Mind Medicine Australia is really working with New Zealand as much as we can. And I think, Alana, you're talking about doing yeah, some work. Yeah, the integration services to New Zealand. So we're, yeah. we're advertising at the moment for practitioners who would be interested in joining our subcontractors. Oh, so maybe Tessa might like to work with you. There you go. Can't see you, Tessa. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a, uh, another question. Um, is the prescription only for psychiatrists or can GPs um, prescribe through the SAS? Who's got access yeah. to this? So, so it's interesting. That's a good question. Um, so psychiatrists, by and large, are the ones who have the greatest prescribing rights, I guess, in this space. But we did see an approval the other day from, from a GP. Mm -hmm. um, and also consulting physicians as mm -hmm. well. I mean, if people are putting submissions into the TGA, I strongly encourage them to recommend that these treatments become available through qualified GPs and, and others as well. We'd like to see a wider group of prescribing practitioners uh, for these medicines over time. So for a medical professional at the moment then, um, there was one question uh, about is there a way to administer these medicines to people at the moment? And I'm presuming that means you must go through the SAS uh, B scheme. Um, where can you volunteer? Would it be best for this person to contact Mind yeah. uh, Medicine yeah. Australia? So, Jessica, um, I see you're a psychiatry trainee. I'm not sure of your full background, but I think you would have the qualifications to apply for the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and we strongly encourage you to apply put your hat in the ring and see if you can get into the course um, have a look at the criteria but if you don't meet the criteria feel free to reach out to us and we'll see how we can help you um, and yeah there's, there's many ways that we can we can support yeah and you can refer all um, all clients or or people who are interested in the SASB program to the Psychological Support Service and our role is to help them assess um, where, where they're at with their, with their mental health, what, what evidence they have for the SASB pathway, what professionals we can get to support them and work with them on their application. So it's quite a, it's quite a wraparound approach to step-by-step step to see um, if we can help them to have access to those medicines. Now, Katriona asks, where are the therapeutic substances sourced from? And she thinks that most psilocybin in Australia comes from toxic cow farm paddocks. <laughs> um, where is the psilocybin sourced from? Well, of course, there's psilocybin growing around us in our gardens um, and in cow paddies and all sorts of places. It's true in paddocks. Um, and um, But the focus with the trials and the research and, and any kind of psilocybin that would be used through the SASB scheme or medically will be GMP grade psilocybin. And at the moment, that's a synthetic formula. Um, uh, you know, it'd be lovely to see in the future that we use the whole plant um, and get the benefits of the entourage effect. But at the moment, um, they're synthetic formulations but they're working very effectively I mean the trial results are extraordinary mm -hmm. and um, we are though looking at how we can build an industry for growing and manufacturing the medicines in Australia so we don't have to import them. Okay what type David asked what type of psychotherapy is generally used as an adjunct to support people? Now Lana can definitely comment on that. 
Yeah, the the, tra- the certificate in psychedelic therapies that My Medicine Australia um, is actually going to be drawing upon multidisciplinary therapies. So it's not one therapy that is used in conjunction. Um, it's it's a range of range of disciplines of best practice that has been woven together with to, with uh, you know the Western model and traditional models, weaving them together to to support the client and be client centered. And to be able to support them with um, whatever whatever background, belief system, spiritual process they they are exploring. There's a uh, comment from one of the um, viewers who's had depression for ten years and anxiety for most of their life. Um, how safe would this be for him? For for what? How safe would it be for him to take one of these um, medicines? I think I'll answer that if I can, Tanya. Yeah. So uh-huh. I'll yeah. answer that if I can. Sure. I, I sure. guess we can't. It, it's an individual assessment process that mm. needs to be assessed by you know a, a psychologist, GP, and psychiatrist. Yep. Um, but they, if they're in, a, if it's in a clinical setting, p- part of the SASB process, and you uh, don't have any other variables that would exclude you from the study or from the process, it's it's extremely safe, non-toxic, and non-addictive. But there's a certain criteria that needs to be met to ensure your safety. Um, but that's assessed, you know, when, of course, when you meet the clinician. Right. Now, Mona asked a good question. Can a, can a compounding pharmacist compound medicinal psychedelics just like you can compound medicinal cannabis? Yeah, you can. I mean, we're talking, we're in discussions with lots of compounding pharmacists and indeed that can be done. Yes. Now, um, and if there's pharmacists out there that wish to talk about that with us, we'd be happy to talk with them. Uh, Marina asks, how do patients access the special access uh, scheme? So um, how do they access, I guess, a, a doctor or GP that would be trained in this? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, you know, if they can find a receptive psychiatrist, um, that would be particularly beneficial and and the, and the psychiatrist could work with us. We've got pro forma forms and, and we'll help them do the application and support them through the process. So it's about finding clinicians who are interested in this field and want to start working in this field. And I guess, you know, one of the reasons why we're doing these sorts of webinars with you is to ensure that everyone on this webinar starts to talk to the medical practitioners about these medicines to get people up the curve and so that they start to realise how prospective they are and how soon they're going to be um, mm. prescribable medicines, let alone, you know, being mm. available now. Great. Now, Paul asks, how important is a sense of ceremony versus simply taking a dose in respect to outcomes? Mm. Uh, Lana, you want to answer that one? Or? Yeah, I'm a bit biased with this, um, but I... <laughs> Uh, look, the the way that the particularly how the course we're designing in Australia or Renee's designing is that it is going to be with a clinical container, which makes sure the client's safe and we're adhering to all the Australian you know regulatory processes. But it's going to be client driven as well, and there will be the therapist will be working closely with that client to see what what they would like to bring into the room, what items, what prayer, mm. what music, mm. uh, and it, it's it's individual. Um, but not dictated by the therapist imposing their beliefs onto that person who's going in for treatment and could be potentially quite vulnerable. So it's striking that balance of um, being very person-centred and then having those models that the therapist can draw from. Okay, well, look, with that, I think we'll need to wrap it up. I'd like to thank Alana and Tanya very, very much for a fantastic presentation. Um, Now, ACNAM do provide monthly seminars, um, webinars which are free to our members. And for those who've paid tonight to join today's webinar, you might want to consider becoming an ACNAM member and having access to our monthly webinars and lots more. Now, our next webinar um, is with Dr Leila Masson at the end of uh, September. And the topic is going to be child and adolescent mental health. Uh, during COVID-19. So that's going to be an excellent webinar too. So I'll bid you all good night. Thank you very much for your attendance and hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.